So this is the point where I turn it over to Dennis. I'm going to introduce Dennis to you. And I'm going to read a short bio. Now his bio, I, it could go on and on and on and on. I, what I wanna emphasize here is that I think Dennis really is the top expert on this in Canada. It's not like a, a sub uh, genre <laughs> of his work. He spent 30 years researching electoral systems and not, the, not so much mechanics, although he can speak to that, but how do we, how have electoral systems changed? Why did they change? When did they change? What were the political circumstances that led to the change? The kind of practical campaign related stuff that is of the most use and interest to Faribault Canada. So Dennis Pilon is an associate professor at York University and Canadian electoral reform expert. He's written numerous journal articles, newspaper articles, book chapters, books, including the politics of voting, reforming Canada's electoral system. And Michelle is going to put a link to that book that you can read. Um, his most recent book was Wrestling with Democracy, Voting Systems as Politics in the 20th Century West. And you can read his bio on our website. So I'll turn it over to you, Dennis. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Anita. And uh, thank you uh, to everybody who's come out tonight. Wow, 174 people uh, coming out on a Sunday night to uh, you hear us talk about uh, proportional representation and, and, and you know, set out some questions. This is fantastic. Really, that's, uh, I'm so impressed with all of you for, for showing up tonight. And I hope that we will get through all of the questions that you have. And in the event that you leave and you don't have your questions answered, you're welcome to send me a note personally. I'm happy to, to respond to any, any questions you have when we're done. Now, I was asked to speak briefly about two issues that are in the news right now. Uh, and so I'll just, I'll offer some comments uh, fairly briefly on them and then we'll open it up uh, to the questions that you have and we'll spend most of our time uh, there. One of the questions was on this ranked ballot or as we know it in the voting system uh, world, the alternative vote. Uh, sometimes it's called instant runoff voting in the United States. Uh, basically, this is a majority voting system. And what it does is it creates the conditions for individual candidates for them to win in a riding, they have to get a majority or sometimes a near majority to win the seat. And there's various ways to do that. Now, uh, our, our, our Ontario liberal leaders call this the ranked ballot system, which is a bit of a misnomer because you can actually use the ranked ballot as a part of a voting system in two different voting systems, at least, uh, that we know of. But right now, we're just going to talk about the ranked ballot as the alternative vote, the system uh, that they use in Australia and that we used previously in Canada. Uh, and so recently, Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca claimed that the introduction of ranked ballots uh, in single member ridings would, quote, emphasize collaboration, ideas, and respect, and reduce opportunities for leaders and parties to vilify each other. He claimed that ranked ballots will reward parties that find common ground and speak to voters' hopes, not their fears. Thus, ranked ballots would make things better for us all, he claimed. Well, I guess the question that I want to address is, do we have any good reasons to believe such claims? Is there, is there actually evidence to support those claims? And the short answer is, is no. Uh, the long answer uh, is that common sense and comparative uh, and historical experience with this alternative voter, as he calls it, the ranked ballot, um, uh, doesn't support uh, the claims that we're, we're hearing from um, uh, Del Duca. So for instance, his claim that ranking, uh, moving to a ranked ballot would encourage parties to deal with each other differently. Uh, and, and the logic of what he's saying here is that if we had a ranked ballot, then parties would, would stop calling each other out, calling each other names, because they'd want to get second ballot support from people who support other parties. So this would lead them to uh, talk nice, uh, act nice, be nice, uh, and be more, more collaborative. But parties actually already do this in our current system when they call on voters to vote strategically. You know, part of the pitch that, that parties make to voters of other parties is that, hey, you know, you should vote for us uh, because we're kind of already supporting some of those issues that you like in Party X, and we actually have a better chance of winning. Uh, so that pitch wouldn't really change under the alternative vote or ranked ballot, as, as he's called it. Uh, we'd see parties making similar kinds of, of, of claims. Um, he also claims, Del Duca, uh, that uh, a ranked ballot would lead to more cross-party collaboration, parties working together to govern or working together on policy. Again, the evidence from other countries that have used this system uh, suggests otherwise. 
So let's look at Australia. Australia has used the single member ranked ballot for over a hundred years. Uh, I mean, it's led to some collaboration between the two right-wing parties who initially introduced it, but no collaboration with anyone else. Uh, and so what, what we've seen in Australia is that it's tended to entrench the ideological divide between uh, the two sides of the political spectrum rather than overcoming it. Well, what evidence is there that this ranked ballot approach would allow voters to be in the driver's side, that they would be able to reward parties that find common ground uh, and speak to voters' hopes, not their fears? Again, not a lot of evidence. Australian experience uh, demonstrates a party system that is extremely partisan, toxic, in the words of many commentators, uh, much negative campaigning. Uh, and, and, and very similar results we saw in the Canadian use of the alternative vote for representation in rural parts of prairie ridings for about 35 years. Um, in terms of the actual impact on the results, if we just look at the 15 Canadian elections that saw um, rural ridings in Alberta and Manitoba use this ranked ballot, the alternative vote, um, only one to 2% of the races uh, did the voting system have any impact on the result. In other words, change the results, allow a party that was not in the lead to become in the lead as, you know, as a result of, of, of ranking. And nor did we see much evidence that ranked balloting was a tool for voters to control uh, the parties. Uh, in fact, in the Canadian context, after the first few elections, um, a majority of voters increasing over time stopped doing any ranking at all. They would make one choice and then that would be it. So it doesn't suggest that the ranked ballot offered voters uh, an ability to discipline parties or change their behavior. Now, on the other hand, there's much evidence to suggest that ranked balloting could be worse than our present system. Uh, the, the results of, of the alternative vote are often even more distorted than our current plurality system in terms of exaggerating the support of spatially concentrated parties, geographically concentrated groups of voters, and, um, and weakening the representation of spatially dispersed voters, voters who don't uh, exist in any one particular place. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that ranked balloting has the effect of uh, basically funneling support back to the major parties and, and erecting barriers to new and small parties. Now, if Del Duca really does want to encourage cross-party collaboration, we certainly have examples of that. That's in our minority governments, as Anita was suggesting. The problem, of course, is that it's very unpredictable uh, when we get one. Uh, sometimes 38% of the popular vote will give you a minority government. Sometimes that becomes a majority government. So the fix for this is not the ranked ballot. The fix for this, of course, is a form of proportional representation. Only proportional representation would represent voters and their parties fairly uh, and create the conditions for collaboration. Collaboration is much more likely when parties are represented effectively and one party doesn't get to call all the shots, uh, typically on the basis of an inflated false majority government. All right, let me turn to the question of extremism. This, of course, is in the news because the People's Party of Canada, which a number of people think is extreme, uh, certainly their views were very different than the other parties on a host of issues. So people uh, thought the fact that the PPC got 45% in the last federal election was of great concern for, for people like uh, Bob Hepburn, the editor of the Toronto Star. This was proof that PR was a bad idea. It would allow extremists like the PPC to get representation. So is this a problem? Is it a concern? Does this torpedo our interest in proportional representation? Again, I, I don't think the evidence supports these claims. Uh, a lot depends, of course, on how you define what is extreme. Uh, I mean, for some people, any party, but the major parties getting support is, is, is extreme. Um, I think that this is often rather insulting. Uh, because it sort of suggests that the voters can't be trusted. Uh, it's kind of a residual anti-democratic view. Uh, personally, I think that small parties deserve representation if that's what people want to vote for, if that's what the people say. Um, two things I think are important for us to consider. Is there evidence that small parties create problems in Western democratic countries? Is it fair to claim, as some commentators do, that small parties get influence beyond their voting power? Again, the short answer, I think, to both queries is no. First, 
Nearly all PR systems have some kind of exclusion threshold that keeps out very, very small parties. So that's already a failsafe in most of the systems, uh, usually a four to 5% threshold in mixed member proportional systems, uh, even higher in a single transferable vote system. Those are the two systems other than the party list systems that we see in, in Scandinavia and the Benelux countries. Um, but even where there isn't a threshold, uh, it's not clear that, that small parties uh, play the spoiler role that are attributed to them by people working within our system. Um, so what happens if a small party does get elected, particularly one that most other voters think is extreme? Well, again, I think we should look at the experience of what's actually occurred in post-war Western Europe or places like New Zealand, rather than just kind of speculate in a vacuum. And this, again, brings us to another long answer, uh, that parties that can't work with others in post-war Western Europe, European experience, um, parties that are considered to be too extreme by most other voters, don't tend to get any legislative influence, either because they don't play, they don't play well with others, or because the voters of the bigger parties uh, would punish their parties for working with them. That's certainly the case in Germany, where the, the new right-wing party uh, is considered to be kind of a third rail, um, and, and no party is prepared to work with them. Um, and so what happens typically in a lot of Western uh, countries using PR is that a so-called extreme party will appear on the scene, but if they don't moderate their positions, if they don't show that they can work with others, then very quickly uh, voters lose interest in them. And so they show up for a few elections and then they disappear because, of course, voters want to get something done. They don't just want to vote as a protest. They want to see that uh, vote have some influence. What about the argument that small parties get too much influence under PR? This is often touted with no evidence from uh, people who don't like PR. Again, uh, big parties that don't want to share power at all often think that any power sharing is too much power sharing. Um, again, Western European experience shows that it's the voters themselves who work this out. Uh, we have lots of examples in Western Europe where uh, the voters of even the party itself that is making unreasonable demands will often punish their own party. Um, and so we see lots of examples because PR is a more flexible voting system, voters have lots of options uh, to deal with parties that are misbehaving or, or making coalitions that, that they don't like. We certainly saw this uh, in, in recent ele elections in New Zealand where parties that had signaled they would work with one party but decided to work with a different party were fairly quickly punished in the next election uh, by their voters. Uh, so a similar thing would hold true in Canada. If, if, if Canadian voters didn't like the idea, for instance, of the Conservatives working with the PPC, then they've got options in a, in a, in a PR system. Uh, they could decide to vote for another uh, major party uh, that they felt was more in line with the kinds of coalitions that they wanted. So there's some general comments on the ranked ballot, bit of an Ontario issue right now, but might be coming to a province near you. Uh, and then extremism, is extremism a problem? Uh, so if you have more questions on that, we can delve into that in the Q&A, but right now I'll turn things back over to our hosts and they can move us into the question and answer period. Thank you, Dennis, that's excellent. It's such, they're, they're both such big topics and I appreciate you trying to <laughs> sum them up into a short uh, space of time. So I'll get to some of the questions here. So somebody's asking, okay, this is the issue about proportional representation in geography. Can proportional representation be made to fit our geography? Um, they're, you know, they're concerned, I think, about our vast rural areas and that kind of thing. The question is, uh, it's not covered in the presentation. Can the speaker explain how a PR system might also counter effect a large percentage of voters, yes, but concentrated geographically, so the system might not well reflect voters in a large country like Canada. I mean, the, the, I think I get the gist of the question, which is, yeah. you know, Canada's got a lot of geography, uh, and the people in that geography are not evenly spaced out. And so that's a challenge. What do we do, right? If we want to have fair representation, uh, if we want to see views from all across the country and not just have, say, urban areas dominate everything. Well, I mean, in that sense, I mean, any PR system will do the job. Um, uh, now, I mean, I think the models that are on offer are ones that usually have a mix of uh, local representation with some sort of guarantee to have party representation that will be proportional. But keep in mind that while we hear a lot of concern about local or, or geographic representation, nearly all Canadians vote party first. 
even when they say they don't, they do. Uh, and people choose parties on the basis of the kinds of policy differences that our parties represent. Part of the reason why I think PR is a good idea is because it would be the best of both worlds. It would, it would bring the geographic element into our ideological differences. So a conservative party under PR would be a much better represented conservative party because downtown Toronto would probably have more influence on that conservative party. Same with the NDP or, or Greens or the Liberals. Um, in a PR system, voters who like what the conservatives talk about or like what the NDP talk about, but live in a more rural area where their neighbors are more conservative, they would be able to bring their rural experience to bear on that party. So everybody's a winner. So I think in the PR systems that people have typically touted, um, they try to come up with a balance of regional or local representation, but at the same time, be able to guarantee overall proportional results in the party. Um, Paul is asking, many people don't understand what PR means because of the variety. What do you feel is the best way to um, move forward and educate the public? You know, basically, you know, you can parse out the differences amongst different systems till the cows come home. I mean, in every country that uses a voting system, none of them are exactly the same. But what we do when we study these things in academe is we look for the similarities. We're, 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 we're lumpers, not splitters. So we're interested in families of voting systems. And so we say, well, these systems are, are very, very similar. Uh, so uh, so they're, we're going to put them into one family. So there's typically four kinds of voting systems that are used in all countries everywhere. One family are the plurality voting systems, you know, the system we have now. And you can use that in single member ridings or multi member ridings. So we use single member ridings for provincial and federal, but you know, Vancouver as a city, as those of you from Vancouver know, uh, use multi member plurality. Then we have majority voting systems. And majority voting systems, again, there's a couple of different kinds. There's the alternative vote we talked about in Australia or the ranked ballot. And of course, France uses this double ballot, you know, have an election, then two weeks later have another election. Then again, with PR, there is three kinds. There's the mixed member proportional system that they use in Germany and New Zealand. There's the single transferable vote system. That's the system they use in Ireland. And of course, we also used previously in Canada uh, for various purposes. And then there's the party list systems that we see used in um, Scandinavia and, and the Benelux countries. Now, no one's pitching a party list for Canada, geography, right? Uh, but people have come up with different models of, of STV and MMP. And of course, we've even seen recently some, some new ideas about how to do uh, you know, proportional voting uh, in the recent BC referendum that occurred in, in 2019. And then the last group of voting systems are what I might call sort of you know, mixed uh, systems. Um, these are systems that mix together two elements like mixed member proportional, but don't guarantee overall proportionality. And so countries like Russia and Japan use a system, it kind of looks like mixed member, but it doesn't create proportional results overall. And that's what's important. When we define the systems, we need to know what kind of results they produce. That's how we're making the distinction. We're not making the distinction on the basis of the constituent parts. We're saying, does the system only ask for a plurality to win? Does the system ask for a majority to win? Does the system, assure that there's roughly proportional results for parties. Yeah, I think I'd like to weigh in a little bit on that too. So I think um, for me, right, having been around here now 13 years, I sort of look at uh, talking about what's better, STV or MMP is some kind of a hobby, okay? It's, it's a hobby, that's all. It's not a realistic path to change. When you actually step back and look at the big picture of what these systems deliver, it's exactly what Dennis is saying. You're going to get local representation. You're going to get more proportional results. And we're going to get the more collaborative politics that we all want. And that's what's important, not debating the minutia of different designs of different systems. And I think for the most part, the movement has moved beyond that uh, through hard experience. <laughs> Uh, so the, here's a question that uh, we get quite a lot, Dennis, how can this ever be changed when the parties that benefit from the current system always hold the power? Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is the greatest hit of the questions of our movement, you know, <laughs> how do we get from here to there? 
Uh, and I wrote a whole book on it, Wrestling with Democracy, uh, where I looked at 18 countries over 150 years. So I looked at every single case of national voting system reform uh, in roughly comparable countries to Canada, other Western industrialized countries. Uh, and um, uh, it's hard. That's the, that's the short answer. It's very hard uh, for the reasons that you've, you've set out, right? I mean, I think most of you have got the idea, right? Uh, parties that benefit from the system uh, don't want to change it. But there were cases where it was changed. So the fact that voting, system, voting systems were at one time reformed in some places does suggest it's possible. And that's why I think the most effective way is to look historically at what were the conditions that contributed. Now, in each case, there were obviously lots of individual factors that contributed to the change. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, which is when most Western countries that changed to PR did change to PR, um, it was the influx of new voters that the traditional parties didn't know what they were going to do, little worried about them, right? So these new voters were largely working class voters voting for left wing parties. And so the traditional parties were terrified. Oh, my God, they're going to get in power and they're going to take away all our property and stuff. Uh, and so they switched to PR as a way of, of limiting their influence. Um, in other cases, PR was brought in after the war, uh, after World War II, uh, by, uh, you know, by the parties that assembled after the war. Uh, and more recently, we've seen voting system reform emerge out of all kinds of, you know, economic dislocations or, you know, in Italy or in, uh, you know, weird party results that were, you know, coming again and again in places like New Zealand. All we can say with confidence is that PR is much more likely when the number of parties start to increase in a party system. So in that sense, Canada's right on track. Uh, the fact that we are seeing Canadians refusing to just vote for suspects um, is in fact the pattern that we have seen in other countries. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that as you say, um, the, the conventional parties don't wanna change because the system's working for them until it isn't. When the conventional parties and their funders, importantly, start to worry that the system is no longer ever going to work for them, they become interested in voting system reform as a way of locking down their support and their influence in any new system. So that, I think, is an important, uh, an important uh, you know, silver lining uh, that, you know, once again, we've had a federal election and once again, Canadians have said, no, uh, we don't just want to go back to liberals and conservatives. We actually want a parliament that reflects more broadly uh, some different ideas in Canada. Um, I have a friend who is pro PR, but does not follow this movement outside of the odd conversation with me. He is in favor of the Ontario Liberals recent proposal to implement AV because in his words, I'll take any step forward. Yep. How can I can explain to him that AV is not PR and AV might be a step uh, backwards. I just want to sort of bring anybody up to speed who's not in Ontario, because like Dennis said, this actually affects the entire country and it affects the voting reform movement. So you all may remember back in 2017 when Justin Trudeau um, killed his promise and then later admitted that he had never actually been open-minded in the first place, that despite a promise to listen to the experts, follow the evidence of you know, uh, make every vote count and we'll examine all options with no preconceived notions. It turned out he had a preconceived notion and it was for alternative vote, which is the winner take all version of ranked ballot or nothing. Um, so we're reliving that dream here in Ontario right now where Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca has just said to it all in his convention speech and all the major media that he will implement alternative vote or he will resign. So that's where we're at heading into the Ontario election in 2022 and why we're, work, we're pushing back as an organization in fair vote quite a bit against the alternative vote because we don't wanna move from one winner take all system to another. So Dennis is saying, how can he talk to his friend and explain to him this is act, isn't actually a step to anywhere? Well, I mean, again, I think that evidence is the best way to try to, you know, change people's minds or get them to think critically about what they're saying. And here's a little piece of evidence. It's never actually worked. 
Um, so we've often heard this, right? If you go back in history and you look at the debates that were made, particularly in Canada, uh, before World War I and then after World War I, the arguments of reformers was, well, you know, let's just take this, we'll, we'll, we'll take this, uh, you know, the alternative vote, you know, that'll be a step in the right direction or these mixed models that were adopted by the farmers uh, in, in, you know, after World War I, where there'd be PR in the cities and the alternative vote in rural areas. And well, we'll take this, this will be a, a step in the right direction except that nowhere did it actually lead anywhere but where they were. If you adopt the alternative vote, that's what you get. That's where you are. It doesn't, it's not some sort of evolutionary step to something else um, because voting systems are adopted because they serve the interests of the people who adopt them or pressure is brought to bear to force concessions from those who can make that decision. And so, um, so that to me is the most powerful argument against change is that, you know, if we had any example, even one example, uh, that adopting AV would lead to PR, um, maybe this argument would hold some weight. But in fact, in every single case where we can see the adoption of AV, it does not lead to the adoption of PR. It only leads to more AV or a return to a single member plurality at some point in the future. Right, okay. And so I also have somebody who doesn't, uh, uh, is asking, well, ranked ballot is a good way to elect the party leader. So why wouldn't it be good for the legislature? You know, that's a fair question. I mean, I, I know that some people will be like, oh, come on, we're gonna have this argument. But it's, you know, for someone who may not be familiar with right. these arguments, I think it's, you know, it's a good, it's a fair question. And the, the reason is, it really depends on what you think elections are about. If you think elections are about electing the best person as a distinct individual separate from everyone else, uh, then I can kind of see why people might argue this, and especially if you can only actually elect one person. Um, but elections don't produce that kind of result. Elections produce collective results. Uh, there's no elections that we're looking at that simply elect one person, uh, except maybe the mayor. Um, we, we elect groups of people. And so whenever we elect groups of people, now we can satisfy this need to reflect the party differences that our votes represent. So the reason why AV is not an improvement is that it does not, it, it cannot reflect the proportional differences of our opinion. Uh, in fact, it does a worse job. What we know from a studying of uh, elections with the alternative vote is that it is a system that is even less proportional than the plurality voting system. Uh, in other words, if we look at the difference between the votes cast and the seats won, the alternative vote produces even more distorted results. The alternative vote is even less open to new parties and small parties than the plurality system is. At least under plurality, sometimes a small party could win a plurality in a particular area. But because the alternative vote insists that a winner have a majority in each riding or close to it, um, then the chances are even less. So in that sense, the alternative vote is a step backwards. If you want ranking, if you think ranking is a good idea and you'd like to be able to rank your choices, there's a much better model. It's called the single transferable vote. The single transferable vote is the best of your both worlds because on the one hand, it will allow you to create proportional results for different parties while at the same time allowing voters to influence the particular representatives who get elected through the ranking process. So yeah, in, on, on all accounts, the alternative vote doesn't do the job. Right, and one thing you may hear when you hear a party say ranked ballot or you hear the Toronto Star or the National Post say ranked ballot, ranked ballot isn't actually a voting system. It's really unfortunate that we don't have the public platform and the billions of dollars it would take to explain this over the voices of the mainstream media, but rank ballot is just the ability to write one, two, three, I like this, and then this, and then this. It can be used in a proportional system or in a winner take all system. But when the media is using it and when the parties are using it, they're 99.999% of the time, they are talking about the winner take all system. And that's why right now we're calling it ranked ballot instead of by its proper name of alternative vote. I just wanted to back, uh, back up what Dennis is saying too about squeezing out small parties because sometimes like I hear once in a while, well, you know, like it, it's a little bit of a fantasy, right? Well, if people can rank and, you know, I appeal to my second choices and stuff, you know, couldn't the small parties get more seats? But when you actually look at Australia, I'm looking at the Green Party getting consistently 10 and 11% of the vote and one seat. So if the goal is to make you feel better, 
that you can rank your true preferences, it's a great system. If the goal is to actually get you representation, it's, it's, not, it's not delivering that representation. And the other thing that Dennis has mentioned before that was rather concerning to me is that it has a track record of, of producing almost entirely majority governments. So for those who think that minority governments are a good thing for accountability and cooperation, alternative vote is probably more likely just to deliver more and more false majorities, back, possibly back to back. Yeah, and, and, and Anita, what's interesting about the Australian example is that you know, the Green Party um, you know, has been around for a while and they've consistently been getting 10% you know, of the vote in national elections and what's interesting is that sometimes Australia has uh, lower house and Senate elections at the same time. So it's the same group of voters voting at the same time. And yet, and they're, and they're voting the same percentages of support for the Greens, uh, for the lower house as the upper house. And yet in the lower house, they're getting one representative. In the upper house, they're getting 10 representatives. Uh, and so it really does show the impact of these different systems, that the alternative vote does not deliver the goods in terms of respecting the diversity of views that voters are trying to express through the voting system. Yeah. So this person is saying, um, could the results in better results in PR countries be related to less vulnerable to industry lobbying? This is actually a, another really, you guys are on. You're on fire tonight. These are really good questions. Uh, and the idea that would a PR system insulate the political system from uh, graft, uh, from uh, you know, inequalities in civil society? And again, the short answer is not entirely because no political system is completely immune from what's going on in their larger society. But it stands to reason that if you need more than one party, uh, to make a government happen, then if you're doing any funny business with, uh, you know, funders, um, it's the chances of it coming out are greater uh, in a coalition arrangement where, where no one party has all the power. What we see again and again in the Canadian context is that governments are in power and then we can't open the books on what they're doing until they're turfed from power. Um, I don't think that's good enough. I think that what we want is a system where of checks and balances within uh, the government. Uh, and that checks and balance is the fact that neither party wants to go down with the ship. Uh, and so the idea that they're going to make some shady deal uh, with investors, I think, is less likely under a PR system than under the kind of totalistic power that our first past the post system gives parties. Yeah, I think this relates to the concentration of power at the top. It's something that people are quite concerned about. And it comes out in the media when, say, a politician makes a bad decision. And then people are like, didn't anybody say to him, maybe that wasn't such a hot idea? Maybe you really shouldn't have done that thing that just blew up in your face? Well, part of the reason that he was able to do that is because it's a single party government. You don't have another party or two other parties sitting around the cabinet table. You have one party in that party's back room. And, and so there's that lack of transparency and that lack of feedback. And when you have two or three parties, the chances that all three of them are gonna say yes to fill in the blank for a bad decision, the, the chances of that goes down because they don't wanna be associated with that. So it provides more, a little more, um, yeah, incentive to think things through. Um, did you see a question that you wanted to answer in here, Dennis? There's so uh, many there's, guys, we can't get to them all. There's a lot of questions and uh, there is some, some overlap uh, in the oh. questions. Um, and so I'm hoping that we're, we're running through, uh, we have one intervener who, who is, um, you know, disputing some of the terms of the debate um, and, you know, how do we define the different systems? Um, I mean, to one extent, he is correct that there is debate amongst academics about how they distinguish amongst systems. But I think most practitioners understand the differences in terms of outcomes. And so that's, I mean, right. you can disagree with me if you want, but I think it's helpful to think about voting systems in terms of outcomes, because that's what everybody cares about, right? At the end of the day, you know, people don't really care about the mechanics of the system. They care about what kinds of outcomes they typically produce. And the facts are that uh, the mixed member system in Germany, in New Zealand, creates proportional results, roughly speaking. Uh, so that's why we call it uh, mixed member proportional. Um, looking through here. Um, are you looking through the chat or the Q&A? I was looking through the Q&A. 
Okay. Um, There's a few people that are asking to have systems explain. And what I would really encourage is the last time we did this 101, uh, the special topic I asked Dennis to talk about was to briefly go over uh, mixed member proportional and single transferable vote, which are the two systems most often recommended in Canada. So that video uh, with you know notes and slides and everything is on our YouTube channel, fairvote.ca, uh, youtube.com slash fairvote Canada webinars, find the picture of Dennis, and he will go over that. And also, if you really want to dig in, uh, it's on our website. And also we did a whole long webinar series with Byron Weber Becker on each system. So I don't really wanna go deep into the weeds of systems. The thing to understand is that there's two main systems that are often recommended in Canada, but going back to the very first promise of single transferable vote in 1921, mixed member proportional and single transferable vote. In both cases, you're gonna have local representation and you're gonna get modestly proportional results and you're going to get a better kind of politics so if you want to get into the the weeds um the mechanics we can do that on a different webinar but i want to talk a little more about the politics of all this first yeah i mean um, that is i think where we often end up is you know that we have people who want to talk about you know how do we get it and we have people who want to talk about how it works uh yeah. you know, both are fine topics but they each require some time yeah exactly um why did the survey uh, in 2007 not lead to anything? <laughs> so, I mean, I guess this is, so I'm gonna make this into a more general question about what's been some of the barriers to success for the electoral reform movement? Because obviously it's not just 2007, we've been fighting this for 20 years and people for 80 years before us. Um, so what are some of the things that we keep running up against? Well, one of the things that we've, we've run up against is uh, I mean, you know, when you go to, well, let me back up. Why does anybody care about this topic? <laughs> why, why, why do we care about it? Why do the politicians care about it? Why does the media care about it? Because the media are often the most powerful no campaign going, uh, you know, in any discussion about voting system reform. And it's because the voting system is the key aperture to the political system. The voting system is like the door into the place. And the voting system puts down uh, rules and constraints on who's actually gonna be able to get power and what is gonna be the nature of that power. So it's really, really important uh, to the parties and to the people who influence those parties, uh, which include the media, which include you know, large corporate entities. Uh, there's all sorts of people who've got a stake in either keeping things the way they are, a very constrained voting system that allows uh, only the most powerful people to really influence the shape of the party system, or uh, a, a more open system, a more competitive and representative one, one that will reflect the diversity of views in the country, and at the same time, force a more collaborative form of governing onto those parties that participate. Um, you know, there's a lot of powers at stake. And so that's why this issue uh, is so debated and so fought over. Um, so when activists go forward and they say, well, we, we think there should be a new system. We think there should be one that is more proportional. The first response, of course, is to ignore it. And so that's the way this has been handled by Canada's media elites and parties for most of the 20th century and into this new century. You say, yeah, go away. You, you guys are nuts. Nobody cares what you think. Once that doesn't work anymore, then the next thing that politicians do is they embrace it. They say, oh, that's a great idea, fantastic. Come on in here and we're gonna keep you busy over in this room, you know, doing stuff and making charts and talking amongst yourselves. Um, and they're gonna put as many barriers in advancing this, the, the issue going forward. And so what we've seen, particularly after New Zealand, and, and you've got to recognize, I don't know how many of you have followed what happened in New Zealand, but it was a, it was a hot mess of voting system reform. I mean, it was a series of accidents like you've never seen. I mean, you know, crazy yeah. results uh, where the party with the most votes lost the election twice in a row. Um, and then, you know, the, the, some maverick member of, the, of a leading party said he'd look at the issue and then he became the prime minister. Um, and then a prime minister promised to have a referendum when he actually in his notes said he wouldn't have one uh, on TV. Uh, it was like a runaway train, you know, um, and our politicians in Canada learned a lot from New Zealand about what not to do. And so what we saw in BC in 2005 and in Ontario in 2007 is that our politicians learned how to game the reform uh, approach they, by saying yes 
Yes, you can have your citizens assembly. Yes, you can put forward a referendum proposal, but we're going to kill it bit by bit in the details. You know, the, the, in, in the fine print, we're going to strangle this thing. And so that's what they did. They, 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 they denied it money. They refused to educate the public about what the options were. Um, they basically kept the whole thing under wraps. In BC, the public almost got away with it. 58% of the voters said, hey, you know, we want to try out this new system. But of course, the government had already rigged the game by setting a 60% threshold. Um, Ontario went even further. And of course, the media in Ontario had learned from BC that you can't play footsie with the Citizens Assembly. That might get its support. So they came out fighting right from the get-go. So answering this question that was put forward, what happened in 2007, basically, and here's, I think, really an interesting point, is surveys showed that a majority of Ontarians wanted a voting system that would keep a local representative but create proportional results. That's what the surveys said. But when the referendum actually happened, a majority of people voted against that very option. And the reasoning is because they didn't know what was going on. Most Ontarians didn't know a referendum was taking place, let alone what it was about. So only the most motivated and committed voters, the ones who had been mobilized by their party, came out to vote. And of course, that was also true in the recent BC referendum, was that the Liberal Party was very motivated uh, to motivate their voters to vote no in the referendum. Well, for whatever reason, the other parties in the media were not interested in motivating everyone else. So this is where we see again and again, uh, you know, the use of these barriers, uh, things like calling for referendums uh, as a way of trying to um, you know, keep the whole thing on stall. Yep. So I've got a question here. How can deputies, MPs, be held accountable in the proportional system? Again, uh, there are various mechanisms. Obviously, in the um, uh, German or New Zealand systems, they have single mode riding. So in that sense, they're subject to the same kind of accountability uh, that we have in our system. Now, some would argue whether our system really does create much accountability. Recall that nearly 100% of Canadians vote on the basis of party. In fact, really interesting studies have shown that even when people say they vote for the local member, it's a post hoc justification for voting for the party they like. In other words, they decide to like the individual who's running for the party that they already support. Surveys that have creatively tried to test people's willingness to vote for the individual have found that if the person running is, if the individual is not with the party they like, then only 4% of Canadians are prepared to say that they'll stick with that individual. So the kind of accountability that people can have is very limited under our current system, um, precisely because it's not very representative to start with. Uh, the PR systems, certainly a system like SDV, arguably is much more accountable uh, in terms of holding individual representatives to account because they not only run on a party label, but they have to get voters to give them a first choice uh, to be competitive to win one of the seats. So there are ways uh, within uh, PR systems to increase individual accountability. Um, but I do think that people need to recognize that the idea of individual accountability is often peddled in our system, but seldom demonstrated to be factually correct. Uh, in other words, that there really is much substance to the idea that our local members are that accountable to us. Okay, and I have a question here that Dennis said, the path to PR is more parties where none gets a false majority. Lately, we've had more minority governments, which is a great stepping stone. Do you have any evidence that Canadians are finally weaning ourselves off of the strong, stable majorities and embracing minority governments? Um, you know, the difficulty with questions about what do, what do Canadians want? You know, we often hear uh, proponents of our current system say, you know, Canadians like majority government. And they base that on surveys that ask people, you know, do you, would you like to have a minority government? Would you like to have a majority government? Well, it's kind of the wrong question. You know, it's kind of like saying, would you like to have your neighbor's house? Uh, would you like to have your neighbor's bank account? I mean, you know, really, is that even a, a question that's relevant? Um, the point is Canadians don't vote for it. All right. At the end of the day, what do people vote for? Now, remember, our system's pretty constrained. People get one vote every couple of years uh, and they have to make it within this single member riding. Having said that, all evidence suggests that people vote on the basis of the broad policy differences that our parties represent. 
Uh, and so to my mind, that's what should be reflected in the results of the election. And across most Western countries, it is very rare for voters to give one party a majority of their support. In my view, if you haven't earned a majority, you don't deserve it. Uh, and so in that sense, the fact that Canadians continue to only give parties a minority of support uh, suggests to me that that's what they should get. Um, that it, it's, not a, it's not a question of what Canadians want. You know, Canadians didn't play any role in the creation of this system. The system we use is a pre-democratic holdover. Um, the people who make the decisions are the political elites. Uh, and so that's, you know, th they're often the people we're fighting with when we're arguing about these sorts of questions. I, I think too, I mean, I've, I'm sure that I've seen repeated studies where people want a majority government if it's their party that gets the majority. but. If they can't have that, then they prefer the minority government over the party that they don't like having. So, I mean, the best option for everybody is the minority or cooperative situation, right? More voter, and particularly in a coalition situation, more voters, many more voters than now are represented in the actual government, you know, or get a, their party gets a turn being in the government than now. Um, I heard to somebody asking your, your opinion of referendums after we make a change. Do you have an opinion on that? No, I mean, I have a, a, a view on this that it departs from many. Um, you know, there, there, there's a popular view amongst political scientists that say uh, that it is democratic to subject voting system rules to a referendum. In fact, to not have a referendum would be undemocratic. Now, I don't know, that seems to me like we're, we're voting on people's rights, you know, and that if, 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 if a majority of people think it's okay to take away rights from somebody else, then it's democratic. I don't think so. I don't think that that, that passes first order muster. You know, there are ideas that there are certain principles that are first order principles. Uh, and the idea in a democracy that if we can, if we can determine, you know, what people are trying to do, and we know from all, all sorts of measures and just facts on the ground that people are trying to vote for parties that broadly reflect their values and the policies that they'd like to see them introduce, then I don't think that taking that away from people is democratic. Um, remember, referendums didn't emerge because the people asked for it. Um, it, you know, it wasn't some groundswell of Canadian demand for referendums. Referendums were a rear guard defense for the current system. Again, let's look at what actually happens, right? Uh, when we look at the examples of voting system reform, until recently, it was very rare for countries to use a referendum as a means of introducing a new voting system. In fact, Switzerland uh, was the only one in the historic period around 1919 to use a referendum. Uh, and then the French used a referendum after World War II to, um, to uh, um, introduce a package, or in fact, Initially, they rejected a package of reforms with a referendum. Uh, Italy also used a referendum after World War II, again, around a whole concept. But it is much more conventional for uh, countries to simply vote in a voting system. We've had 10 voting system reforms at the provincial level in this country. Every single one of them has been introduced simply by a vote of parliament. And so, you know, to my mind, this fetish of a focus on referendums moves us away from the justice of the arguments that making every vote count is just the right thing to do. And I don't hear any compelling arguments from anyone, political scientists or otherwise, uh, that tell me that keeping a system that does not actually reflect what voters vote is somehow more democratic. Uh, so that's why I just don't, I really have very little patience for the referendum arguments. I, you know, one of the things that Justin Trudeau said, and I don't often quote Justin Trudeau on voting reform, um, you know, he said to, uh, he was at a, a presentation and I do believe it was a university class and somebody was, uh, you know, doing the must have a referendum thing or whatever. And Trudeau said, you know, a referendum, I don't mean to say that this is you personally, uh, but a referendum is usually a pretty good way of making sure that we don't get any electoral reform. And I would, I mean, that was a pretty honest statement, actually. And when you look at his preferred alternative vote system, it was put to a referendum in the UK by politicians who didn't want any voting reform, and it got 32% of the vote. So 
what we've seen is that referendums are put forward by parties who don't want change as a way to block change, regardless of whether they're upfront about the fact that they don't want change or they're hiding behind, let's just ask the people. Meanwhile, the people mm -hmm. are subjected to almost no information and a whole bunch of fear mongering, inaccurate information and then asked to go out and vote on that. And the only effect of referendums has been really to put the nail in the coffin in for 10 or 20 years in whatever particular jurisdiction they win. So we yeah, haven't yeah. seen it. We haven't seen it as a good path to electoral reform. It's not an evidence-based path, and it's certainly not the norm around the world, as, as Dennis has said. I mean, what's interesting about referendums is that referendums are often just reflected party opinion. Um, I mean, the great mass of voters don't know very much about voting systems. And why would they? They hardly ever use them. I mean, I applaud all of you here tonight because you are clearly, you, you are my kind of people, right? You're interested in voting systems. We are the geeks, okay? Um, we are not typical. I'm, you may have picked this up from your conversations with your friends. Um, you know, they are not all clamoring to talk about voting systems. And, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know how to fix a car. I mean, I can, you know, tighten some bolts, but I'm not called upon to do that. And, and the same with the voting systems, right? The great mass of people don't know anything about voting systems and frankly don't care. Um, they're, they're happy to either not know or take the word of someone they trust. And on complex topics, we know from studying politics that voters use their party as a proxy for knowledge about things that they don't know. So the irony is, is that people call for these referendums because they're going to be some great statement from the people, when in fact, they're just recycled party, excuse me, recycled party opinion. The referendums reflect the intensity of belief amongst the parties and their ability to mobilize their supporters. And we have seen that again and again in this country, where the parties that are threatened by the voting system reform, who often have much more significant resources to deploy, they are able to make it an existential crisis and convince their voters to go and vote it down. Uh, whereas parties on the other side of the question, particularly those who are underrepresented in our current system, well, not surprisingly, they don't have the resources. And so they aren't able to mobilize their uh, potential supporters to defend this new and more just system. I think referendums and on voting reform, they almost inevitably um, become just a partisan argument. You know, and we saw the results in previous rec referendums where 85% of people, you know, who support party A will vote how party A told them to vote based on the messages they're getting from party A. So we're not getting an evidence-based and informed opinion, which is why Fair Vote Canada is pushing for a citizens assembly, which has, has some superficial similarities to a referendum, but it's actually quite different because you're taking that um, misinformation out of there and where you're giving people, ordinary people, representative people, not just the ones who show up because they're motivated by the party, but ordinary people a chance to really look at this in depth and in a nonpartisan uh, setting. I also want to comment about the referendum after um, because we hear this quite a bit and it's from the NDP and I know that um, yeah the NDP has been some depending on where which level the NDP has been somewhat of an ally in electoral reform, certainly federally they have been. Um, and you know, they're saying, well, we'll have a referendum after, and they point to New Zealand. But one thing pe most people don't realize is that one, it wasn't some master plan to have a second referendum in New Zealand. It wasn't like, wow, we just had this plan for voting reform. It's just like Dennis said, it was a bunch of accidents combined with political circumstances that came together. Uh, their, their stars were lucky. Um, the second thing is they never planned a second referendum. That was something that was pushed by the right-wing party who wanted to get rid of the reform. And they had it after five elections. It's not like, let's try it out for one election. And then if everything is dysfunctional because we make it so, um, then we'll have another referendum and we'll make sure that we get rid of this thing that doesn't work because the newspaper said it doesn't work. Okay, they had five elections in between. By the time they had that second referendum, there was a whole generation of people who had never voted under first past the post. So if you wanna have that kind of follow-up referendum, sure, but the one after one election, I, I think that the vested interests would be quite interested in reverting back to first past the post, but that's just my take on it. Do you see any other ones, Dennis? Well, there, I mean, there's so many questions here. And, uh, you know, again, I, I'm, I apologize. Five minutes. In, in, we got five minutes left? Yeah. Um, 
you know, I apologize to everybody if we haven't if we haven't gotten to your question uh, because these are these are very good questions. Uh, Tom says, "Go to the Q and A." All right, I will. Um, uh, right down at the bottom, Tom says, "Can I comment on the current course case uh, briefly?" Um, uh, court going to court is is a dangerous route um, because should should justices make democratic decisions uh, when they make them the way you like them, it's okay. Uh, if if they don't, uh, and I'm not sure that that our justices. Uh, you know, necessarily appreciate the historic struggle for democracy. Uh, Canada didn't start as a democracy. In 1867, very few people could vote. Um, and so to, you know, go back to the founders' views of things seems to me to be somewhat mistaken. Um, it could work, it might not work. Uh, I think ultimately, uh, we've got to push this politically. Um, that's the way that we'll get a result that sticks. Uh, and that brings us to this idea of, you know, should we have a, you know, a vote on it later on? Again, I think if you if you think that uh, you know uh, representing people fairly is the right thing to do, then I don't know why that would change. You know, after ten or fifteen years, uh, someone put in a question about indigenous representation. That's an excellent point. Uh, I've written a little bit on that. Uh, you can find that on my Academia Edu site if you Google Dennis Pilon. Uh, and where I talk about how, yeah, a majority of our indigenous peoples live uh, in urban centers, um, and yet their votes are completely washed out. Uh, in in you know in the in the amount of people who live in those spaces, so a, a proportional system would uh, potentially allow them to organize politically however they like and have more influence on the basis of their indigeneity. That's certainly been what's occurred in New Zealand, uh, where it's where it's actually forced all of the parties to put forward more indigenous representatives um, and to come up with more indigenous policies. There's even been an indigenous party that was elected and then. And then, and then they weren't elected. Uh, so again, we see how that system is much more flexible and fluid in terms of representing the things that people want. I think diversity is a really important topic and it's something that's come up a lot, particularly on the left right now and definitely indigenous people. And I think the connection to the winner take all voting system, and this is true with alternative vote, winner take all rank ballot, as well as first past the post, is that when a party only has to run one candidate, that's a, a real barrier comes in because you have incumbent candidates that are always going to uh, get, almost always going to get that nomination. They may even be protected from any competition uh, for being able to run for that seat. So that prevents a barrier to new people, um, including indigenous people, women, other minorities, being able to break into the system and win and run and win in a winnable riding. So what proportional representation does, regardless of which system it is, is it requires the parties to put forward more than one candidate. And as soon as they have to put forward more than one candidate to reflect a, a broader community, their candidates better start looking a little bit more like the community or they look bad. So that's where the natural incentive comes in. And then we get people on the ballot to vote for who can actually win um, that will lead to a more demographically representative Parliament. And yes, it, like Dennis said, it lets groups uh, or have the ability to organize with it and get representation without having to be the plurality in the riding. Yes. No, I know, Anita, that we're running out of time. And so I just want to say to everybody, the questions that you are raising are the right questions. You know, this is excellent. You guys are really just pulling together. I mean, these are the tough questions that I think, and you're right, that you're asking these questions. It probably means that other people want those answers too. You know, people in your communities, people that you know, I appreciate that you are bringing your questions to us because you had people ask the questions of you. Um, and so it's always the case in these kinds of events. We never can get to everything that people have put in there. I'm, I, I appreciate the fact that people have put resources in the chat uh, and connections to other things. So hopefully you'll find some of those resources uh, helpful. And as I say, all of my published work is available for free uh, on Academia EDU. So if you just Google Dennis Pilon, you can read any of my reports and chapters and all of my book, The Politics of Voting, and part of the other ones. Um, and if you want to email me your questions, I'm happy to take them up. I'm not going to put my email here in the chat because you know I don't want you know, it out there for everybody. But if you Google me, you'll come to my institutional uh, site at York University, and you can you can send me whatever questions. I'm happy to follow up with you. Yep. And thank you, Dennis. Thanks for taking the time to join us tonight and do this 101. We've done this twice this year, which is sort of unusual for us, but it's because we're growing and growing as a movement. It's really exciting uh, to see more and more people coming on board. And you know, every time the door is slammed on electoral reform and we think that's it. You know what I mean? You have that, oh man, moment, you know, like when you lose in BC or Trudeau, 
it's back and it's not going away and there's only more of us and politicians keep promising it because they know it's popular. And so the, the interest in it is actually growing. The way you can help us is share the, you know, sh for instance, I just sent out a email about the difference between Germany and Canadian elections. People really like that. It's a blog on our website, share it with your friends to help them understand what the actual difference is with proportional systems. If you're in Ontario, we have an action going. It's right on the front of our website, uh, asking the other party leaders to show some leadership on electoral reform so that the alternative vote uh, fan club isn't uh, driving the bus in Ontario. We need some pushback on that for, to the Ontario Liberal Party. Um, and of course you can donate we don't get donations from corporations. We don't get grants from foundations. We don't get, we get individual people who support us. That's how we do all the work that we do with individual donations. So if you want to support us financially, that would be just lovely. And I think that's, that's it. Thank you all of you for taking your uh, time tonight to join us for PR 101. And we will do this again. Mm -hmm.